If you want to take your Bibles and turn me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, I found it fascinating. If you ever wonder how the Lord works through an entire uh, Sunday, here's what I want to tell you. I was sitting out here at the sound booth and uh, I was trying to get a few things ready. And Bert starts talking in Sunday school about Deuteronomy 8. I haven't talked to Bert in two weeks, I think, about anything that I'm doing. I thought, hey, Lord knows already from Sunday school till now exactly what you're going to hear. So you're going to hear a, a more of an expounding upon Deuteronomy chapter 8. But as we begin, I just want you to think about some of those periods in your life. Anybody ever walk through the wilderness? Have those struggling inquisitive perhaps even doubtful moments i think every christian has those moments some are longer some are shorter we may revisit that from time to time but I, uh, since we've been going through proverbs chapter one these last eight weeks and we finally get to the spot where we are expounding and expanding off of that uh verse seven where everything begins with the fear of the lord this really comes down to this we're going to take a couple weeks and look just just kind of go through a journey through the wilderness that is that is right here in deuteronomy chapter 8 and i want to just read the whole chapter but we're only going to look at verses 1 through 5 as we do this today it says every commandment which i command you today you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land of which the lord swore to your fathers and you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your hearts, whether you would keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as a man, that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and to fear him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains of springs, and uh, that flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley, of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of olive, of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity, in which you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and out of whose hills you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. But beware. That you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when, you, and when your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and your gold are multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up and you forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which, you're, in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought water for you out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, My power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. As the nations which the Lord destroys before you so you shall perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the lord your god heavenly father as we open up your word as we look upon you for understanding for truth may we remember lord that you are a holy god you are deserving and worthy of all worship 
Father, I pray that for those who are in a path wandering through the wilderness, they remember who you are. For those who have just exited it, or those who may even be preparing to enter it without knowing, may we all remember who you are. Father, we just ask this in your holy name. Amen. This is the simplistic message that I just give you today. We're not going to get uh, uh, in-depth theologically or academically today. It is the simple reminder that continues to be throughout the entire Word of God, and it is that we are called to remember God. Everywhere we go, we are called to remember God. My dad used to annoy me with uh, this saying. It haunts me to this day, but it's true. Right? Every time I wanted to leave the house, he would always stop me, grab my arm, look at me, make me look at him. And then it was just remember who you are. Simple phrases, but it was always that little nugget of guilt. Right? Uh, he thought, oh, I almost got out of the house. But, but this, is, this is who we are as God's people. This is what God says to us. Remember who you are. Because you must remember who I am, who I called you to be. The word tells us we are to be holy for God is holy. Now, if we look at those first five verses, we're going to find some specific things. And it's really interesting what we can learn here. See, when we look back into the Old Testament, we are looking at biblical history. This is why, this is why I laugh at those people who hold the the viewpoint that the Old Testament does not matter for the modern day Christian. It is here where we find some of our most valuable information about who God is and the, and the reminders and the warnings that, that he gives us. And the greatest one is to continually remember God. See, as we think about history in itself, history is a great thing if you actually keep it in the place it's designed for it to be. There's a, a historian by the name of Stephen Ambrose in one of his books, To America, Personal Reflections of His Story, and he writes this, this simple little thing. He said, it is through history that we learn who we are and how we got that way, why and how we changed, and why the good sometimes prevailed and sometimes did not. See, we're supposed to learn from history. His history itself is a wonderful teacher if you actually look back and attempt to learn from it. It teaches us what to continue to do, how we are to develop in what is good. It teaches us what not to do and what to stay away from. It teaches us who we are, why we are that way, and probably most importantly how we got that way when we either followed God or did not follow God. See, history is designed not only to keep a record of our actions, but more so a record of God's actions designed not for God himself. I want you to remember this. God does not need a reminder of who he is or what he has said. Now, you don't need to have that conversation. God, do you remember when you were talking to me the other day? Uh, do you remember those promises that, that you gave? He already remembers. What he wrote down is for us. Right? He doesn't need to remember, but for you and I, as his children, we need to remember his works. And praise the Lord, we have his remembrance right before us. Throughout, throughout biblical history, any time that God did a great work, he called the people to do something special. Right? Normally, it, it, it had to deal with stones. They're called milestones. Right? He piled them up all around his land. So that way, whenever or wherever the, that his people went, they would see that God has worked or is continuing to work in their lives. See, milestones, they're supposed to be visual representations. Here's your first reminder. God has done a great work in your life. If you were here today, God brought you here. That could be the greatest work that he has revealed thus far to you so you can hear the gospel. So that you can see God more clearly. I've, for many of you, God has done multiple things and has 
called you to remember what they are so you can learn and remember that you can trust him, that he is a faithful God. But milestones are supposed to be visual. If you are anything like me, mostly men, right? I know we are, we are all pretty much this way. If somebody moves something off of the counter where we laid it, it's non-existent from that point on, right? right? If you don't see it, it doesn't happen. We're visual representations, right? This is where we ask all our questions. Uh, dear, where, where is that? Oh, I moved it. Okay. Where? I don't know. Right? We both do this multiple times. It's husband and wife thing. It's, it's, why did you move it? I was tired of looking at it. You ever, you ever hear that one? Right? I've done it. I've said it. I've had it said to me. Milestones. But however, when God does something in your life, is there some place in your house or your job, on your desk, in your car, that you look at and you remember, God did this for me on this day? He is a faithful God. See, this is what we are called to remember because we need help. We need help in remembering. When we look at verses 1 and 2 in particular, when God says, or, or Moses is writing here, when he says, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply. Do we actually take these, these warnings seriously? See, Moses is writing this, or, or at least he's speaking it at this time. He's recording it for us. By this time, he's an old man. He's nearly 120 years old. He's speaking his last instructions from his relationship with the Lord that has been given to him to pass down to his people that came out of his relationship with God as their leader. Now, if you think about this practically... Anybody who reaches that stage where they know the end is coming, there's always a final lesson that they want to pass along, given the opportunity. Please remember, or please stay away from this. Stay on this path. Always cling to God, whatever it may be. See, for the Israelites, the journey through the wilderness is just about over. They are ready to, to enter the promised land. The exodus is already done, and now Moses is sharing things worth remembering about our great God. And the first one always comes back to remember his word and just follow it. It doesn't get any you know, more important than that. Remember God and his word. Over these 40 years, right? He's speaking to Israel. Over these 40 years, God has done an amazing work time after time after time and that is in the midst of all your complaints he still did it now think about this practically when was your last argument with God that is really quiet <laughs> I'm gonna say recently then but just remember this that in your in your spiritual life, from a practical uh, uh, point of view in pause that we're going to do, and then we'll dissect Israel in just a second here, you have been through a journey in the wilderness at one point or another. It may be one year, it may be two years, for some of you maybe it's 50 years, I, I don't know. Maybe you had a 40-year journey, but all along the way God has done specific things in your life. Do you remember that? Right? I just want you to stop and think about how he has led you through your spiritual journey and has never let you go as his son or daughter. That he has always been walking with you. Never to leave your side. Let me give you some remembering insights of uh, why and how we do things here at, at uh, First Baptist from a leadership standpoint. Right, these are these are the fun ones. For you, you are free to come and go as you please. Just as it is anywhere else in this in this world. You are free to come and go from Sundays and Wednesdays to the next. You do not get any extra special attention because you, you made it uh, fifty two Sundays out of the year. You do not get any special attention because you gave more money than the next guy. Okay, 
your attendance and your work for the Lord through this church is based off of your commitment that you made to the Lord. It is all about God. And it is made off of your commitment to the people around you that you are serving with. You were not coerced. You were not arm barred. We did not hold you down. We didn't make you do any of these things, even though some of you have needed some extra encouragement along the way. Perhaps the, the greatest thing is that you're free to struggle. And now this frustrates some of you. Pastor, why do you allow people to struggle in the manner that they do? Let me give you two main reasons. Number one, because you're not ready to listen. That's, that's as simple as it is. You've heard things. You have received instruction. What is the responsibility that you have after you receive instruction? Do something with it. However, I'm, I'm talking to all of us, right? I mean, this, this is all of us. So this is what we do. Many times we sit and we wait for you to go through your questioning process, through your preparing process for God, for the work that God has in store for you and the church, uh, at church together in the days ahead. If you know anything about struggling, it is often painful. It is painful for you and it is painful for those who are trying to help you as you make your decisions. But here is the beauty of struggling. It is absolutely the beauty. It is in those moments that your convictions become reality. They are secured and fastened to our Lord God. They become real. This is why 1 Thessalonians 5.21 stands out to us so much this year. Hold fast what is good. What is good is God. See, you are free to also express your mind, which some of you willingly take advantage of. <laughs> but this is where you express your struggle. And many times you're often encouraged to do so. And the reason for that is when you speak it, here's the secret motives, by the way, of leadership, church leadership. I'm giving away all my trained stuff here. When you express your struggles, you no longer... Keep it a secret. Therefore, because it's out in the open, you now have to do something about it. That's the great thing. See, either you're going to have to make a decision or we're going to have to make a decision. One of the two. But in how we, we uh, convey our struggles is where we reveal our motives. It's where we reveal our perspectives, our worldviews, and how big you see your God really is. How he is revealed before us. Now, if you think about this from Israel's perspective, every time they complain, their view of God became next to nothing. Their motives became very self-serving. Their worldview had to do with pleasures and foreign gods. That's complaints. That's what complaints do. See, this is where we as people are challenged with our love for one another. This is why most people run away from dealing with people problems because it's difficult. It is in this stage that we forget that we are supposed to have respect and for one another, reverence for positions that have authority over us in a variety of fields, or just simply we forget to ask questions to gain further understanding. Instead, many times we are led by brashness, by our demands, ultimatums, lack of tact, a mindset of superiority. Simply put, we test the genuineness and longevity of our relationships here in this realm with one another. So this is the beautiful thing when we express our struggles. So you're not thought less of when you do so. We all have them. We need to. We need to get them out. Though there may be times that we are confused or frustrated. But this is what wilderness journeys do. We need to understand this is the basis of a wilderness journey. They root out false desires, attitudes, motives for you to remember who God is. That is how we help one another. That he is a holy God. These wilderness journeys that sometimes God takes you through is for you to learn and remember to be dependent to be transformed and humbled by our great God. To love his word, to follow his word and his work. 
but it's also for us to remember that we also need people around us to help us on our journey. See, why do we do this as leaders? Because this is the two arguments. It's a flip side argument that we get. Pastor, you need to deal with their problem. Great. Okay. We know that side. But what about the other side when somebody actually says, hey, I'm going to deal with you now? Are you ready to listen? Because this goes for us as sinful human beings that the Lord is, is working on. Why do we do this? Because we all grow at different speeds. We learn different things in our relationship with the Lord, and we need a safe place to work some things out. That's the beauty of having close relationships within the church. You ever realize that sometimes you have to talk things out to get all the junk off your mind in order to see things clearly? That's the safe place with one another before the Lord God. See, a relationship that is challenged and is dependent upon God and his word will come out refined and stronger than when it first began. A relationship that is never tested is a relationship that is superficial. See, the whole point and the reason I am telling you this is for you to remember your journey through the wilderness and help somebody else that's going through theirs. But if you're going to do so, you have to be patient and you have to be long-suffering. And by the way, is that not what Christ does for us every single day? See, I want you to remember all the ways in which the Lord God has led you up until this point today because that's what God has asked. That's what he has commanded in his word. And I want you to notice in verse 1, going back to the text, he says, Every commandment which I command you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply. So there's two things I want to point out to you, and the first is this. His word is truth, and God's truth brings life. Okay, his word is truth, and his truth brings life. Every commandment of God keeps you walking in holiness, in reverence, in love. It's what God calls love. Every commandment of God... Go guides you to what you what, what what are genuine green pastures. Every commandment keeps you from, from the danger of sin and temptation. It builds the relationship between your creator, your sustainer, and you. That is the beauty of obedience. Right? Obedience builds relationships. Now, whether you are in a friend relationship, a parent relationship, child relationship or even a spousal relationship if there is not a love for one another if there is not an obedience in those those words that you say what happens to that relationship very quickly it blows up and no one begins to care for one another and even those who try to love are met with great obstacles. I want you to just flip over to chapter 6. In verses 10 through 25, there is a caution against disobedience that I want to remind you of this morning. It says, So it shall be, when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities which you did not build. Now stop right there, and I want you to remember this. You can apply this practically. When the Lord your God delivers you out of the problem that you have, or out of the struggle that you are in, or answers your prayers that you have prayed, then we get the following verses, right? So put yourself in those moments. It says, House is full of all good things which you did not fill. Hone out wells which you did not dig. Vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. When you have eaten and are full, then beware. Lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him. And shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods. The gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in, in Massa. 
You shall dil diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God, his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you, and you shall do what is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with you, and that you may go in and possess the good land in which the Lord swore to your fathers, to cast out all your enemies from before you as the Lord has spoken. And when your son asks you in time to come, saying, What is the meaning of the testimonies, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And the Lord showed signs and wonders before our eyes, great and severe against Egypt, Pharaoh, and all his household. Then he brought us out from there, that he might bring us in to give us the land of which he swore to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as it is this day. Then it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Obviously, Israel struggled with this remembering commandment throughout biblical history. For you, I would give you the same cautionary tale. As God has taken you, answered you, moved you for his glory and your benefit, you must continue to remember your God before you think it was you who did every bit of work. See, it is his commandments that teach us about God's holiness. It is his commandments that uh, uh, teaches us what it means, why it's necessary to fear the Lord. That our call and duty to serve our God is a mighty one. We are called to teach our children about the works beforehand. To please our Heavenly Father. See, His commandments are for our good, for our eternal preservation, because obedience produces righteousness. Life is not found anywhere outside of the Word of God. I hope you remember that today, out of the truth of God. Life, if, if the truth does not lead you to God himself, it is not truth. Very simply put. Now, if you look back at verse 8, or at chapter 8 and verse 2, this is one of the great verses in the Bible that you can cling to in times of instruction, in times of understanding. So when he says, And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble you and test you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Yes, God does purposely lead you into the wilderness to humble you and test you, to cleanse you, to increase dependency upon him. See, remembering God and his past actions instills and it encourages a devotion and loyalty to him that, and to no other gods. Why does he continue to remind us, you shall have no other gods before me? Because it only takes a moment for us to look elsewhere. So the simple question is, do you remember God's work in your life today? Because he is working. Time and time again, he is working. Now you might be the... Uh, the guinea in of people and just say, God, I need another sign. God, I need another sign. God, I need another sign. Let me give you a little piece of advice. Here's pastoral biblical advice. Listen the first time. Follow it the first time. Things go a whole lot smoother. The humbling process is shorter. That's all I'm saying. It's shorter. So when we get to this verse 2, I want to root this out with you a little bit. It is God who brings about humility. In humility, the act of becoming humble is sometimes a painful process, but ultimately a necessary one. See, the worst spot anyone can be is in the thinking that they have learned enough. There's nothing left for them to learn, or there's nothing left for this teacher who stands in front of me to teach me, or more so... There's nothing left for God to teach me. See, this is pride in its greatest sense. And by the way, this happens all the time with, with all of us. We battle with pride. See, if you look at the military, when it is working correctly, 
Their training is designed to break you down from what you think you know to what you actually need to know. Police are the same way in their tactical training. Any good sports team is the same thing. As a coach, I can tell you I, uh, I met every kid with the same way. Coach, I already know what I need to do. Great. No, you don't because you're not doing it. And until you do it, then, then you can learn how to do all the other stuff. And this is the same way with God. Why do you think God's people were in the wilderness for 40 years? God, we get it. No, you don't. You still don't see me as God. You still don't know who I am. See, humbling is simply the breaking of pride and self-exaltation. Now, I want you to think about this in the current culture explanation. What are they teaching you? Every time you turn on a channel, it's Pride Month for something. I don't know what it is. I, I try not to watch it, but it's pride everything, right? With the, with the emphasis of you, 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 and you, where God is saying, by the way, I created you, I sustain you, I hold you. It's all about me. It's time for you to worship and understand who I am. So this is what God does for you and I on a regular basis. For his honor and for our good, he humbles us. See, thoughts become actions. I know this is stuff that you already know. Right? Thoughts become actions, but they become so deeply rooted in our behavior, you can act quickly from, from your training without consciously thinking about it. That's the whole point of training. But without proper training, these actions become harmful, they become self-serving, and ultimately destructive to you and those around you. If you think about Israel, all of their complaints were, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty, I'm tired, God, why don't you solve all my problems right now? I'm tired of walking around. It was never of, God, I will follow you. I rely on you. I trust you. Wherever you go, I will send you. See, without humility, sinful pride is always going to lead you away from God, his word, and your devotion to him. I think you can testify to this very clearly if you look back at the milestones in your life where you were obedient and those that you were disobedient, how God has worked in your life. But let me give you another warning. If you turn with me to the book of Amos, it's three books past Daniel, third in the Minor Prophets, in chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Everything we see in our country right now has already been warned of throughout Scripture. Nothing is new under the sun. But it's very pointed. Starting in 6, it says, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go in to the same girl to defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine of the condemned in the house of their God. Yet it was I who destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was as strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit above and his roots beneath. Also it was I who brought, up, brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you forty years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorites. I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your young men as Nazarites. Is it not so, O you children of Israel, says the Lord? But you gave the Nazarites wine to drink and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. Behold, I am weighed down by you, as a cart full of sheaves is weighed down. Therefore flight shall perish from the swift. The strong shall not strengthen his power, nor shall the mighty deliver himself. He shall not stand who handles the bow. The swift of foot shall not escape, nor shall he who rides a horse deliver himself. The most courageous men of might shall flee naked in that day, says the Lord. There is a cost of disobedience. There is a line that God says, no longer will I answer, but I will bring judgment and justice. 
If you think of this, and if you look at this, this is the picture of our world today. And here's a description of what it gives us, and I think you can make these correlations. The love of money becomes greater than the love of God or people. As it says very clearly that they sell the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of sandals. To use those of lesser means to gain greater wealth and prestige is promoted over love and compassion. There is a greater lust after material items, perverting justice to line people's pockets. There is an increase in calling what is evil good and what is good evil, everything that God has said before us. Sexual deviancy knows no bounds, as it says there, it does not get any clearer than a man and his father go into the same girl to defile my holy name. It's very accurate and pinpointed as God describes things. And the whole thing about it is through sexual deviancy and disobedience, it makes a mockery of God's truth and morality. And serving other gods in the name of pleasure and self-gratification is not all of those things what is promoted all around the world. I want to remind you today of Galatians chapter 6, where he tells us, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. I don't know about you, but the legacy I leave behind, whatever that may be by the time God calls me home, I do not want it to be one that says, Behold, I am weighed down by you, by your life, by your life of disobedience. I would much rather hear, Well done, my good and faithful servant. It should be a motivation, above all else, to remember who God is. Now here's the great thing. If you flip back to chapter 8 in Deuteronomy. See, God in his love, he pours out his grace and his mercy. Are you thankful for God's grace and mercy in your life today? See, it is in that humbling process that he breaks our pride. It is through humility we learn how to rely on God and not our own wisdom and strength. It is through humility that God roots out the sin that leads us to suffering and despair. It is through humility that we learn what godly love actually looks like. It is through humility that we find in our freely given life eternal. It is through humility that the state of our heart is revealed, and then, because God is who he is, cleanses us by his word. If we look at verses 3 through 5, he says, He humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone. See, God humbled the Israelites on purpose, and I will say he does the same thing to you and I. He allowed them to hunger so they would feed on his provision. To teach them what Jesus quoted. Uh, this is where Jesus was. right? In his 40 days of fasting, he was being tempted by Satan. When he, when, he, when he talks to Satan, this is what he says very clearly. You shall not live by bread alone. Life is not found merely in the physical things that your body needs, but from every word of the Lord your God. This is what humility teaches us, who God is. See, he reminded them of his provision physically, but then he also reminded them of his provision spiritually in verses 4 and in 5 when he says, Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. That's, that's physical provision. I would love a pair of pants the last 40 years. I do have t-shirts that are 20 years old, and I'm still working on them. Or shoes that would last more than a year. I might pay $100 for those shoes. But this is God's provision. When he says, I will keep you, it means I will keep everything about you. But then he gives us verse 5. He says, you shall know in your heart that a man chastens, that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. This is this 
his, uh, uh, the reminding of his love for them spiritually. He chastens and corrects those he loves for their good. I want to remind you that today. If you are being disciplined by God, it is because he loves you and wants you to become holy in his sight. He wants you to be pure. He wants you to have those victories over sin in this world through dependence upon him, through his gifts that he regularly bestows upon you, by his goodness, by his mercy, by his grace that he pours out regularly. In Hebrews chapter 12, in verses 5 through 11, it says, in, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. It is an act of love that he takes you from one spot and moves you to another. It is an act of love when he takes you through some hardships in your life for you to be cleansed and strengthened to be righteous and holy. He goes on, he says, if you endure chastening, and by the way, you must endure chastening to come out. Most people run away when they receive the first bit of instruction. Let me tell you why our kids have a problem. All right, I'm going to rant. It's biblical. <laughs> our kids have a problem because we forgot the chastening of the instruction, of the correction, the commandments of the Lord. And now we receive the, the articles and news information that it's a hate crime to tell somebody no or that your job was terrible or you need to redo it or uh, maybe you should ask for help. Right? That, that is the problem. And what happens with our kids because they did not receive the instruction that was supposed to come from mom and dad? Depression, drugs, anxiety, all without hope. Everything is without hope. And ultimately, it goes to more and more young individuals taking their own life because they forgot mom and dad disciplines you because they love you. God disciplines you because... He loves you. The word tells us in verse 8, it says, But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You realize that when you hold back discipline, you are holding back godly love? Amazing. It says, furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he is in God for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. God corrects you in order for you to be partakers of his holiness, to learn righteousness, to be filled with joy for his glory, for your profit. I want more of joy. I don't want more of suffering. I've had my fill. I'm sure more is coming. There is no doubt about it. There's two different types of suffering, by the way. There is suffering for the work of God's kingdom, which is always good. And then there is suffering for disobedience, which is painful. See, humility, as God puts this, tells us that when, when he is chasing us, we are legitimate, blood-bought children of God. He loves us because humility teaches us holiness. And if there's anything that people need to see right now is that God is a holy God, worthy of worship, designed to be feared in a reverential manner. He is our creator. He is our sustainer. He is our everything. He chastens us because he loves us. Do you get what I'm saying of why it is important to remember your God, your God today? You must Remember your God. It is time for us to remember his works. And I will tell you right now, God is working all over our country. You may not see it in the levels that you want to see it, but we see it in the hearts of people. 
And God is concerned about the hearts of people, their eternal souls that he does not want to see lost. It is time to remember and be thankful for God bringing you to and bringing you through the times in the wilderness. It was for your good. I can tell you right now, clear as day, I can't give you dates. I'm terrible with dates. But I can tell you moments and give them with you know, extreme clarity of the milestones where God said, either enough is enough or now do this. God's work is amazing. It is simply amazing. It is time to remember that our spirit and our physical bodies can only be truly satisfied by the nutrients of God's word. It is time to look back at the milestones that God has set in your life to remember and return, or perhaps remember and strengthen your devotion to the loyalty of your creator, your provider, your savior, Jesus Christ. It is time to remember why we must be obedient to God's word that always brings holiness, righteousness, and eternal life. It is time to remember verses 1 and 2. Remember the words of the Lord. Remember that when God purges sin from you, it is because he loves you. Remember to hold fast what is good. And what is good can only be described of everything of God. I encourage you today, just in a simple fashion, take some time in your day today to look back, see God working in your life. Be encouraged for what God has in store for you ahead and pour out your thankfulness to your Lord God who holds you in the palm of your hand. We have a great, great Will you remember who he is? Let's pray together. Father, we admit to you today, we are not always good at remembering and choosing to remember who you are. The desire is to do so, but we battle with pride, with self-exaltation, with our own desires and wishes and we are easily led astray when we take our eyes off of you, when we are not replenished and refreshed by the daily renewing of our mind in your word. Father, when our love for every extracurricular thing overtakes our love for you, Lord, we struggle and we need to remember. You have never stopped being the same God since before you created the world. When we were born, until we were born again, and until you call us home, you were always the same God. Father, we thank you that you are mighty, you are faithful, you are holy. Father, in those times we are struggling, or it seems like the world is darkening around us, may we remember your promises and hold fast to them to cling to what is good, to remember that nothing can defeat the name of Jesus Christ, that we have already been bought and saved by the blood of Jesus for those who have called out upon him as Lord and Savior and asked for his mercy. That no one can take us out of the palm of your hand. Father, we thank you that even when we forget, you are faithful to remind us who you are, that you chasten us when we are wandering, that you discipline us when we are disobedient, because you love your children. Thank you for never changing your standard of holiness and always being who you say you are in your word. You are great and mighty, and we praise you today. Father, we just lift up our praises, our thankfulness, our gratitude to you today. And we ask for the help that you continually give us to remember who you are. Father, we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us today. We have some coffee and snacks out back for you. If you need any conversation, by all means, please see uh, Bert or Chris and I about some things we may help you with. If you are in a type of wandering, or if you just want to share some praises and laughter, we're really good at that too. God bless. Have a good day. <laughs>